So I'm uh, really happy to be here, and I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts about um, this ongoing project. It begins with a story. It is the 1st of July in 1800, shortly after 6 in the morning. Despite the early hour, there is already movement. Don Cayetano Diaz, a reputable surveyor and map maker, opens the study window of his well-appointed home in Guatemala City. The shutters, as with all buildings in this colonial capital, open onto the street, where wide stone sills offer perfect vantage points for watching passersby. Diaz does this every day. He opens the shutters and then sits down to work at the desk just below the window. On this morning, he realizes at once that something is different. There is a strange object on his sill. He calls to his brother, for already the object seems ominous. There are drops of blood on the sill's cold gray stone. Diaz's brother hurries from the house to seek a doctor, and as they return, coincidentally, Diaz sees another acquaintance passing by the window and calls him into the house. Don Narciso Esparragosa, one of the most renowned surgeons in Guatemala, indeed a leading figure of enlightenment medicine in Spanish America, is making his way to the nearby hospital. Together, the four men inspect the object on the windowsill, and now there can be no doubt. Placed on a lily pad, as if served on a plate, is a woman's breast. Narciso Esparragosa examines it with a surgeon's eye. In fact, it is not one breast, but two. They are attached, cut from the body in the shape of an hourglass. The one with less skin has been folded beneath the other. At the far end, the skin extends all the way to the underarm with its scrap of dark hair. Esparragosa believes that the cut reveals no expert skill. And he states that he cannot fathom what has prompted someone to do such a thing. None of them can fathom it. They don't understand it, but they do understand that this is a criminal act, a deeply offensive and disturbing criminal act. The evidence must be recorded and the authorities must be called. It's only because of the coincidence of Cayetano's skill as a map maker that we, readers in the present day, have a visual impression of what he saw on the morning of July 1st in 1800. Illustrations in criminal cases of this period are rare. But Diaz was a talented map maker with the colored pencils he used for his meticulous drawings of land parcels close at hand. And one of the four men must have realized that he was uniquely suited to depicting this most unimaginable piece of evidence. His illustration of the severed breast appears on the second page of the voluminous records for the criminal trial that ensued once the authorities were called and the investigation had begun. Diaz made this careful drawing with such precision in the depiction of the rounded breast, the tuft of hair, the incongruous lily pad, that the body becomes unrecognizable in its verisimilitude. We never see the body this way, mutilated, disembodied. When I first saw this drawing in the archive in Guatemala City, I was flipping through the pages, not really reading, looking for other stuff, and then I stopped, staring at this inscrutable cluster of shapes for several seconds without actually comprehending what they were. In fact, not until I had begun reading the case, lured in by this enigmatic drawing in the margin, did I understand what it depicted, and the horror dawned on me retrospectively. This is what it looked like. The horror we experience, experience realizing the fact of these body parts in the window is in some ways similar, but also probably different to what people in Guatemala experienced at the time. The fact that Guatemalans were horrified in some way is clear. Action was taken immediately to identify the owner, as they called it, of the breasts. A young woman believed to be the victim had disappeared the night before, and the case was treated as a homicide. More than a dozen people were jailed over the course of the investigation, and dozens of testimonies were taken. More than 100 folios, pages, were filled with depositions, orders, correspondence, and speculations on the part of presiding judges. A special patrol was created to lie in wait for the perpetrator. But do these actions indicate horror, or do they indicate something else? This case offers a mystery and a challenge. The mystery, of course, is what happened. But I think the more interesting mystery lies in the challenge. 
understanding these events, and particularly the communication offered by the objects in this case, as Guatemalans in 1800 would have understood them. What did these severed breasts mean to the people who saw them? What did they communicate? The book project I'm working on around this case is structured as a narrative. The events are unfolded one piece at a time. Around each event, I offer a context, an angle or a perspective that can shed light on the events in potentially new ways. In the paper that follows, I lay out my interpretation of these objects, these events, and invite you, I hope, to suggest other interpretations, contexts, and meanings. So first, we have to reckon with the place. Guatemala City in 1800, a city only 25 years old, created in the wake of a terrible earthquake that almost completely destroyed the former capital. The building of this new city required an influx of labor. And in this instance, that labor came from far and wide, resulting in a place that was filled with unknown faces, strangers. In this context, context the breast might be read as a clear statement about anonymity, a testament to how, in this changing place, crimes could be committed by an unknowable perpetrator. When the severed breasts were found, a woman came forward whose daughter had gone missing the previous evening. Brigida Arana said that her daughter, Liberata, had fled from the house the night before. Having seen the breasts, because they were on display in the city center, she could say with certainty that they looked like her daughters. Suspicion fell upon two strange men, as they were described, who had come to find Liberata late in the evening. Their strangeness, along with the girl's disappearance, led the authorities to suspect a gruesome homicide. But the lengthy depositions with Liberata's family and acquaintances rather changed this picture. It turns out that Liberata was not lured away by two strange men. She escaped through a hole in the floor beneath her bed. Why such an inconvenient manner of escape? It seems that before Liberata escaped, she was no stranger to violence at home. Her mother was in the habit of beating her severely, often when she was drunk. The breasts might also, perhaps most obviously, be interpreted as a token, memento, or communique about violence. The breasts are the remnant that describe an action. How common was such violence, or the rather different kind of violence that Liberata knew at home? It's difficult to really say. Violence was a fairly frequent occurrence in Guatemala City in 1800, but comparisons to other time periods make little sense because of how social violence was recorded and prosecuted. There are about 3,500 cases of social violence at the Archivo General de Centro America, the AGCA, where I've done a lot of this research. And these are overwhelmingly clumped at the end of the colonial period. In the 16th century, there was only about one case per decade. In the 17th century, there are about six per decade. 150 per decade in the 18th century. By the end of this period, there are hundreds per year. And there were 1,800 cases in the first decade of the 19th century. So obviously, these figures are a distortion. We cannot say that there was 1,800 times more violence in the 19th century than in the 16th. But we can look at those hundreds of cases per year at the end of the colonial period and see what was being prosecuted. <clears throat> Domestic abuse of the kind Liberata endured, of parent to child, does not register. I know of only one case in which a woman was tried for burning the hands of her young nephew, but this case was an exception. <clears throat> Spousal abuse does register, but likely not in a representative way. Only 223 of these 3,500 cases. So what was most common? Homicide accounts for 1,000 of them, and heridas, or injuries of various kinds, account for 2,000. Mutilation is almost unheard of. There's one very intriguing case, unsolved, that occurs about 15 years before this one, but it's the only one I've seen. And certainly the deliberate, intentionally runic quality of this crime is unique. For those of you doubting that this is deliberate, consider what happens next. Later in the month, on the 26th of July, a pair of hands appear on another windowsill. They were placed with their palms facing one another on the sill of Doña Brigida 
Manzano, uh, who lived across the street from Don Cayetano Diaz. No one had seen who put them there. The hands both give us more to interpret, and they complicate the possible meanings. Would the breasts and hands have seemed more similar as pairs, bodily extensions, or more different, hidden, invisible, reproductive, not sexual, not to Guatemalans? Examining iconography familiar to Guatemalans, I try to place the severed breasts and hands into a greater visual and symbolic context. It seems most likely that for Guatemalans at this time, the placement of severed breasts on a lily pad would have referenced St. Agatha, the medieval martyr saint whose breasts were severed. Representations of St. Agatha, like this one from the 16th century, often depicted the breasts placed, one might even say served, as they are here on a plate, apart from the saint. So people who viewed the breasts would likely have recalled St. Agatha and the circumstances of her martyrdom. The lily pad that the breasts were placed on is enigmatic. My best guess is that it references Maya iconography. The lily pad was associated <coughs> with the divine serpent, a symbolic conduit through which mortals and immortals communicated with one another. And then we have the hands placed suggestively together as if in prayer. And these would have recalled the countless images of kneeling supplicants, hands pressed together and raised. But it could be that this person was attempting to communicate something altogether different. The doctor Narciso Esparragosa, who repeatedly gave evidence in this case, had just introduced in the very same year a new practice at the city hospital, the Hospital San Juan de Dios. He taught students of surgery there, and he had begun instructing them in anatomy by dissection. In the past, the students had used wax models. And if we are to judge by the wax models of women made in the 18th century elsewhere, the experience may well have been erotically charged. These so-called anatomical venuses, their necks arched and eyes half closed, express an ecstasy that for us today makes a disturbing contrast with the vividly splayed inner organs. In other venuses, the intestines fan out explosively from the body, and the breasts are separated, or they flap open. Even if we put the possibility of being primed by the wax models aside, students of surgery would have experienced a radical change in practice in 1800, finding themselves suddenly with once live bodies on the dissecting table. And some may have found the practice <coughs> objectionable hospital staff, members of the religious community who also offered health care, or others who knew in this smallish city how Esparragosa now taught anatomy. I can imagine these objects as either derailed enthusiasm or outraged criticism of these practices. Esparragosa is a curious figure, in some ways a leader of enlightenment medicine, in other ways a relic of earlier practices. He gave evidence in dozens of criminal cases, and his testimony is by turns illuminating, by turns baffling. In one case, he explained that a man died from the insults hurled at him by a neighbor. A surprising conclusion, typical of an earlier and more traditional way of thinking, but also typical, it turns out, of the mixed influences that characterize Enlightenment medicine. Esparragosa was cutting edge in some ways and old school in others. He was very much of the moment in how he understood miasmas, the fetid airs that could cause disease by proximity. We know this because his next task, after finding the hands, was to preside over an exhumation ordered by the fiscal, the attorney for the crown. The exhumation, and these are the documents related to it, the exhumation finally yielded something tangible related to the crime an exhumed corpse that was missing its breasts, hands, and other body parts. She was found in the cemetery of El Calvario, a church at the city's edges, and Esparragosa examined the body on site. By questioning the priest who had buried the body, he learned that it belonged to Simona Villagran, a woman who had died of a long illness in July. She had spent much of her illness at the San Juan de Dios hospital before she was taken home for her final days. Her corpse suggested where the hands had come from, but the breasts had surely come from elsewhere since Simona was alive and whole on the 1st of July. The authorities here were now compelled to shift their investigation from homicide 
to corpse mutilation and to the prospect of multiple corpses. Following in their footsteps, I examined a logbook of women patients admitted to the San Juan de Dios Hospital in the year 1800. It gives a remarkable window onto the kinds of illnesses suffered by women of the time and the possible connections between illness, marital status, and race. One of the most striking findings resonating with the court cases in interesting ways has to do with injuries. When we look at unmarried women admitted to the hospital over the course of the year, the leading complaint or diagnosis is fever. It's like an oval more than a circle. And injuries are not especially prevalent. But when we look at married women, the picture changes. Injury is the leading reason for entry to the hospital by far. A stark indication of how bad it was for your health to be a married woman. And also a clear indication of how rarely even injuries severe enough to warrant a hospital visit would actually wind up in court. But these hospital logbooks hold even greater secrets. Because it was here that I found the identity of the woman whose breasts were left on Don Cayetano's window. Though I had read the hospital logbooks more than once, it was not until the third or fourth close read that I spotted her at the very top of the page, the very first entry for July. Manuela Trujillo, a poor woman who gave no account apart from her name, Natural of Guatemala, died the same day. Why did I miss this so many times before it jumped out at me? It's hard to say. All I know is that the officials at the time missed it too. But this has to be her, a woman who died in the very early hours of July 1st, unassisted. She came with no one else to the hospital, so weak that she could not give her age or her ailment. Her body was probably moved to the morgue, and then from there it seems to have disappeared. You might have noticed that the hospital is starting to seem like a significant place. I've thought the same thing. But what can we learn from this other than to speculate that a hospital worker or maybe another patient or a frequent visitor was involved? And why did this person keep targeting the same block? A few days after the hands appeared, a pair of ears was left once again on the window of Don Cayetano Diaz's house. Now, we have several significant events and places to map. And it helps to think about the city, I think, as a network, an urban space with its own rhythms and routes. As you can see here, the San Juan de Dios Hospital, at the western edge of the city, which is at the bottom of the map, lay not far from the block where the breasts, ears, and hands were found, the smaller rectangle. If we look at the placement of El Calvario, where the mutilated corpse of Simona Villagran was discovered, it becomes clear that the three make a route. Was this perhaps a path that the perpetrator walked routinely? It's likely, but I think we also need to think about other ways in which city space was used. The key to my eye is this little spot right here, a plaza, a place where a person who walked frequently between El Calvario and the hospital could stop for a break. And not just that, stop and watch for a moment of silence, for a pause in foot traffic that would lend a temporary cloak of invisibility to the perpetrator. Apparently, the authorities figured out something similar because indignant over the outrageous impunity of these actions, they stationed alcaldes, police officers or magistrates, all over the block. This measure seems to have been effective in one way at least. It pushed the perpetrator to a new location. In September, a new and especially gruesome piece of evidence was found. The body of a woman left in the San Juan de Dios morgue was found with its genitals mutilated. With this piece of evidence, Esparragosa's examination of Simona Villagran's corpse took on a different cast. He had observed at the time that the breasts, hands, ears, and buttocks had been cut off. He thought also that her lower body had been further mutilated, but he decided that more likely decay had caused the tissues to rupture. In retrospect, it seemed likely that his initial impression was correct. But despite the fact that the perpetrator had already done this before, the discovery, this last one with Padilla, feels different. For one thing, it's not a piece of a body. It's a person, Maria Rosa Padilla, in that, in that way that corpses are still recognized as being people-ish, 
personhood persists where it manifestly no longer resides, as Tom LeCur writes in his recent book on the work of the dead. To make matters worse, the mutilation was discovered by Padilla's daughter, Petrona Padilla, who had arrived at the morgue to wash and dress her mother's body for burial. Think about how differently this was experienced. The body parts were made anonymous by their removal. They implied a body. But here, in contrast, there was a body with a name, a face. The person here is visible, not merely implied. This is also different in its explicitly sexual nature. It's a sexual assault. And I say that with certainty because of how Guatemalans and Spanish Americans more broadly understood the dead to be still present in real and important ways. The dead were, to paraphrase Natalie Zaman Davis, another age group within the family, and still materially significant to everyday life. It's only in our day and age that the dead are so radically exiled, pushed to the edges of conversation, marginalized from society by institutions and habits and mindsets, even as they approach death. There are a couple more twists and turns to the story, less sordid, I promise, than the discovery of Padilla in the morgue, but revealing nonetheless. In September, not long after Padilla was found, Liberata Bejarano turned up alive and well. She had clearly been living as a runaway in Guatemala, Antigua, Guatemala, for she was found there in a doorway and hauled back to Guatemala City. Her reemergence and the resulting dead end in the alcaldes inquiries gives us an opportunity to think about how the Bourbon justice system worked and how it didn't. For despite the long investigation and the hours of manpower expended, the perpetrator of these crimes was never found. In some ways, the case marks a spectacular failure for these officials. In other ways, it demonstrates the ambition of a justice system transitioning from the occasional punishment of egregious crimes to the deliberate investigation and pursuit of criminals of all types. It's here at the end of the story that I want to try to make the most pronounced argument. Despite the apparent failure of justice officials in this case of corpse mutilation, what we are witnessing through this case is the emergence, I think, of a young police state. Before I explain further what I mean by this, let me clarify what I don't mean. I don't mean to argue that this moment, the late 18th century, is the origin of Guatemala's 20th century police state. Such a teleological argument would be entirely too pat and I think impossible to prove. The 19th century brings about collapse and dysfunction in many of the institutions that would be required for a police state to function. So the argument is not about the future. It's not about the 20th century or even the mid-19th. It's about this moment. What is going on at this moment? You'll remember the striking rise in the number of cases that occurred in the late 18th century. The marked increase in the number of cases over the course of the colonial period is certainly due, at least in part, to the effort, uh, efforts of Bourbon reformers, the gradual series of reforms that influenced many aspects of social, economic, and political life in the Spanish Empire. In Guatemala City, as in other Spanish American urban areas, a deliberate tightening of social control made itself evident in how patrols kept a close eye on public drunkenness and public behavior. Taverns had to improve and brighten their lighting, and people were limited in what kinds of weapons they could carry. For example, short weapons that could be concealed and presumably used maliciously were banned. At the same time, the Spanish-American police and military were strengthened. As Ana Margarita Gomez has demonstrated, an increased military presence in the late colonial period led to a greater militarization of Guatemalan urban areas and to more invasive social coercion. Though troops were initially necessitated by the foreign wars, they were gradually relied upon more and more for domestic policing. Their duties in transferring the Guatemalan population after the earthquake from Antigua to Nueva Guatemala transitioned easily into urban patrolling so that by the late colonial period, troops in urban areas were working hand in hand with officials to monitor and disarm the population. As a result, the 3,500 cases at the AGCA say a lot about how alcaldes worked and how the record keeping of the justice system worked. To put it simply, they tell us something about crime, but they tell us even more about crime fighting. What I see in these 3,500 cases is the deliberate naming, delimiting and regulation of violent acts and their instruments.
These cases reflect a concerted effort to define violence in specific ways. Previously, the definition was kind of up for grabs. Now, the state, through the work of alcaldes and fiscales and escribanos or scribed, scribes, defined violence with intent and rigor. So how was violence defined? Here it becomes very interesting. Patterns emerge among these many cases, patterns of prosecution and of neglect. Considering these, the, consider these following two examples that I'm going to give you relating to verbal insults as little vignettes that demonstrate the trends. And keep in mind that verbal insults at the time were seen as a form of violence. In 1804, an escribano and an alcalde, two officials, are heading out for the evening ronda. They're kind of round through the neighborhood. And they hear one Micaela Vivar raising a ruckus at her house. When they go to investigate, they find her at home with the door closed in the company of four men. Micaela is also drunk and scantily clad. As they drag her and the men out into the street, she hurls insults and obscenities, proving so unruly that they tie her up. When she confronts the alcalde, she insults him as a cochino alcahuete amancebado, excuse my language. She's placed in the Casa de Recogidas, and the men are placed in prison. An illuminating document fo that follows their arrest dwells on the insults hurled at the alcalde, insults that he suffered as is described, and that were particularly onerous, the document says, because they were made in public. Micaela is sentenced to six months seclusion, and the men are only found guilty of nothing more than drunkenness. They receive no sentence. In contrast, consider the case of Maria Alexa Carranza, who, in 1790, trying to make peace between a man named Luis de la Rosa and his sister, gets a slap on the face and an insult, puta mancevada, for her troubles. Though she brings the case to court and offers the witness testimony of four men, the case is dropped. So the most appallingly clear point, of course, is gender. And it's true that women are on the losing end of this redefinition of violence. Domestic abuse is almost never prosecuted, though if it results in a woman's death and the couple had children, the case is sometimes pursued. Rape is rarely prosecuted. And in fact, Spanish legislation from 1796 took the astounding step of declaring that cases of estupro rape should no longer be prosecuted since they were deemed not worth the trouble. This is borne out repeatedly by cases in which even violent gang rape is essentially ignored. But rape of children and incest could still move the court to action. And cases that involve women of high class provoke a strikingly different response. Even lesser transgressions against them, such as one case that revolves around what we would consider stalking, could elicit attention and indignation from court officials. So children and women of high class appear to be eligible as victims of violence. And then the largest category of eligible victims, men. Men could be victims of insults, of injury, of homicide, of assault, and the violent crimes to them are punished with alacrity. This is especially true when the crimes are committed in public. And here we find two more interesting trends, both evident in the case of Micaela Vivar, the drunk woman hauled out into the street. Recall that the court was especially appalled by how the insults to the alcalde were in public. I believe that this is what lies at the heart of the official outrage, or even horror, in the case of the severed breasts. Not concern over the mutilated women, because all of them were poor and of mixed race, and case after case demonstrates that women of such a class were not understood to be classifiable as victims. Instead, concern over the flagrant disregard for public order and authority. In some ways, these severed body parts were actually insults. Insults to the alcaldes who patrolled the streets and the judges who enforced the law. Insults to their honor and to their ability to uphold justice. Listen to what Don Juan de Collado, the Guatemalan fiscal, had to say after the hands were found. Quote, consider for a moment the actions before us, exposing those tragic and horrific fragments in such public places. And in the most recent case, at such an hour, that is in the middle of the day, it demonstrates an incredible audacity, a direct insult a flagrant contempt for justice, and a shocking absence of fear, all of which suggest to me the following course. 
There are so many judges in the capital, 12 alcaldes de barrio, comisarios Pances and Lorenzana, who were officers of the Holy Inquisition, and officials of the Audiencia Chamber. We could arrange a certain distribution of patrols so that every day three or four men head out in different directions, expanding the reach of the alcaldes de barrio to the whole city and its suburbs, meeting beforehand at each patrol leader's home. A plan would be made regarding approach and area covered. That's the end of the quote. A ramped up presence, an intensity of patrolling. And let me remind you what this patrolling could look like by returning to the case of Micaela Vivar and pointing out the second trend. Who initiated the violence in that case? Micaela had been in her home with the door closed and she was dragged out into the street by the alcalde. She was actually bound with rope. That's what patrolling could look like. So what did this does this tell us about the definition of violence in this period. Most clearly, the state did not perform violence, or to clarify, the actions taken by officials like these did not fall under the new Bourbon definition of violence. Violence was an insult directed at an official, an assault against a man in public, a slight on the honor of a high-class woman, an injury to a child. Those all fell under the definition. But violence was not raping a servant, beating one's wife. It was not any action taken by a justice official. This radical and aggressive redefinition, which is what I believe we see in these 3,500 cases, laid an important foundation, creating an atmosphere of impunity for crimes, as we would see them, against women and civilians, while simultaneously creating an atmosphere of stifling oppression for categories of people who were ineligible as victims. In this last portion of the talk, I want to discuss methodology. As I think this presentation will have made clear, I've been working as a kind of methodological magpie throughout the length of this project. On the one hand, I have some modest attempts at bean counting in the social history vein, but I also attempt to grapple with visual symbolism, and I rely, uh, in some cases, on theoretical texts along the way. The tool I rely on most is storytelling. I was a fiction writer before I was a historian, and I continue to be. This project has given me the opportunity to combine methods, but it's also strained my sense of disciplinary boundaries. <laughs> and let me explain a bit what I mean. I've been writing this book as uh, something like a research memoir. I am a character, the narrator, who tells the reader about going to the archive and finding things there and wondering what they all mean. In so doing, I present findings and I discuss secondary sources, like all historians. But I also try to describe what occurred in Guatemala in 1800 as a story. And though the two are mostly compatible, these efforts, sometimes they tug me in different directions. Here's the last piece of evidence, chronologically speaking, that I have for the case. It's a letter from Jose Mariano Roma, an al alcalde in the city dated 1804. In 1800, this, course per this court pursued an investigation into who had left a pair of women's breasts on the window of Don Cayetano Diaz, a pair of ears at the same house, a pair of hands on the window of the house diagonal to it, and a pair of human buttocks I know not where. I have before me now a case with similarities to this one. And since they are so similar, it seems likely that whoever was a suspect in the last case could again be in this one. As such, I need to see the described documents, which I ask you to send me with the greatest possible alacrity, with the understanding that they will be returned to the court. May 7, 1804. So I could not have invented a better cliffhanger if I had tried. And though I've scoured the criminal cases at the AGCA, I haven't found any more documentation relating to this 1804 uh, case. So what am I to do with this? How much conjecture should I give the reader? And how much should I keep my suspicions to myself. To end, I offer two somewhat contradictory observations about these questions, and then I look forward to your thoughts about what this balance should look like. The first observation is that I found storytelling to be inextricably wo interwoven with not just the writing of this, but the thinking of it, the analysis of the case. And I don't mean that in a kind of facile, all history is fiction way. I wouldn't be able to sketch the perpetrator's route through the city without thinking narratively. I wouldn't be able to infer why Liberata ran away without thinking narratively. Some of the basic building blocks of analysis here, and I would argue in all histories, are narrative thinking. I use that phrase with a nod to what philosopher 
Louis Mink has theorized as narrative explanation that is the flip side of the coin, the technique used by writers to convey what they mean to others through narrative. Mink argues, I think, persuasively that this foundational mode of thinking, narrative, is a distinct analytic and cognitive mode. A second observation is that, with some embarrassment, I have found myself more bound to the evidence than I ever imagined I would be. I prefer the term record to evidence in the way Jack Hexter uses the word when he distinguishes between the first record, historical materials, and the second record, the historian's mental equipment. I find that I don't want to make things up about Manuela Trujillo, or Simona Villagran, or Maria Rosa Padilla. I don't even want to make things up about the perpetrator, though I feel like I'm on pretty safe ground assigning him a gender, but maybe not even that. Why is this? I'm not a historian who feels very strongly about evidence and proof. I like conjecture when others do it, and I like it when historians go out on a limb. But to be honest, I find myself humbled by the realities of these people's lives. My inventions about them feel like liberties. I'm chastened by a sense of respect, and at the same time, I'm troubled that this narrative form I believe in so strongly, fiction, is thereby construed in my own thinking as a form of disrespect. But that's how it is. There are details about these people's lives that bring me up short and that forbid me from going further. Simona Villagran was in her 30s when she died. She had an infant, only a few months old, who died a couple weeks before she did. Her sister described Simona as utterly broken after this, succumbing to death with little resistance. And she was survived by another child, a 10-year-old daughter, who gave testimony in the case about the state of her mother's corpse. I feel equal to the task of observing this moment, even trying to imagine the perplexity and grief she must have felt. But I don't care to elaborate it. The shape and limits of that grief, the weight of it, are hers alone. Thank you.